So thank you, Rafael, for your invitation. Uh, uh, what I'd like to speak today about is a, uh, is a project done in collaboration with uh, Artur Nieskoda, who was my PhD student and now is he's in uh, ICFO, at ICFO with uh, Antonio Asim doing his postdoc. So this project is about uh, a relation between uh, a non Bernon locality, many body, in its many body aspect and uh, uh, the role this kind of correlation plays in uh, the enhancement of, of quantum methodology, enhancement of precision methodology. So uh, the outline of this talk is it's pretty simple. First, I will just speak about the hierarchy of quantum correlations and uh, about this, this basic triad of quantum correlations. I will use a particular form of color, correlator and of a quantum system to, to show you how they set in a, how they form a hierarchy. And then I will uh, quickly remind the role of entanglement in quantum methodology, though I'm, I suppose most of you are uh, absolutely familiar with these topics. And then I will present the main result of this of this uh, work, which is the relation between the Bernoulli locality and quantum methodology. And finally, I will illustrate these results with some physical systems like a music chain of, of, of a number of qubits or a set of bosonic qubits like you have in a Bose-Einstein condensate. So uh, just to set the stage, something very simple, uh, I guess, is about uh, a classical correlation. What I mean by when I say a classical correlation, I have a collection of objects, spins, uh, particles, so parties, however you, you name them. And uh, I assume that for each of these uh, parties, there is a, a local observable which is accessible, something like a projection of a spin or whatever you want. And in, in principle, these local outcomes uh, can depend on local settings like uh, orientation of a polarizer or, or whatever you can think of. So these objects E1 up to EN uh, serve as a, a starting point to construct a, a correlator, which uh, I would consider in a, in, a, in a following form. Maybe I will take a product of n, these outcomes, locally measured outcomes, and uh, average over many repetitions of experiment. This is an average of over whatever is, is there to average, you know, some statistical, some, some fluctuations, quantum system or whatever. And uh, uh, I will call this object correlator, I will call it a, a classical one, if uh, it can be expressed in, in a form of a classical average, yes, so an averaging of a product of local outcomes, and uh, these depend on, on some random variable which introduces some, some probabilistic behavior of your system, or in, in context of, of non-locality, this is often called a, a hidden variable of this, this object. And the row is a probability density for, for this random variable. Okay, so again, this is our system of n parties. Uh, this is our classical correlation and a, cla a non-classical correlation is simply such that cannot be expressed in this way. This is my... My, my understanding of what non-classical means. And uh, uh, there are basically three types uh, of correlations which I consider in my work. Uh, the first one is uh, related to what we call entanglement. And entanglement, as you well know, assumes that these uh, local outcomes, E1 up to EN, are calculated with prescriptions of quantum mechanics, which means that you have some uh, local density matrices for each subsystem, and uh, you, you have a, a corresponding P of the M, and you calculate the price. So you use the, the methodology of, of quantum mechanics. 
And uh, if indeed your correlator cannot be expressed in this form, this means uh, that your system cannot be expressed in a separable form, which by definition is what we call an entanglement uh, There is a, another form of quantum correlation, which is a bit stronger, well, a bit, it is stronger, and this is called einstein podolsky rosen theory. And uh, this, uh, the difference between this approach, where we assumed quantum mechanics for all subsystems, and, and this point of view, or this kind of systems, <laughs> is that we do not assume quantum mechanics for all subsystems. Yes, so some, for some of them, they are constrained with the rules of calculating local outcomes, which are provided by quantum theory, and some are not. What, what it means, some are not, I will specify in a moment. And uh, finally, there is the bare non locality, which uh, imposes no restrictions on these local outcomes, apart from some very general restri restrictions, like that you have binary outcomes for each uh, output or something like this. But you make no restriction about the validity of quantum mechanics. You want to be as general as possible. So this means you almost assume nothing. Almost means that you, you have some, some limitations, like, as I said, that the outcomes of, of your measurements locally are binary. But apart from this, uh, you do not use this kind of, of rules which apply to some particular theories to calculate these uh, outcomes of local measurements. And uh, let me give you a very simple example to, to illustrate how this works in a particular case. So let's take three, uh, three qubits, or uh, more generally, three subsystems which give you binary uh, outcomes. And uh, let's assume, like you typically do in this Bell stuff, in this Bell business, let's assume that each uh, subsystem measures to to quantities, so call them sigma x and sigma y. There are no hats here, okay? So this is not quantum mechanics, some not operators, or averages of operators calculated for, for spin one half. This is, for a moment, this is more general. So they, so for each of these subsystems, you measure some sigma x and sigma y, or you can think naturally about orientations of a polarizer and measuring a, polarization of, of light or, or spin. And uh, you, we have these binary outcomes for the first uh, particle, second particle, and third particle. And uh, for each of them, so I here is equal one, two, or three, uh, let's construct this very simple complex number, which is sigma x plus i sigma y. Okay, so this is a complex number which is constructed from these plus minus ones. And uh, uh, let's construct a correlator, which, we, which I will use, by the way, throughout all the remaining part of, of, of this talk, which is a product of these three guys. So sigma plus for the first, for the second, and for the third, averaged over whatever is fluctuating in the system, modulus squared. And this is, I call it E3 to underline that this is a, a three body object. If this is classical, it means that this average, as I argued on the previous slide, you can write as a modulus square is modulus square. This is attached. And this averaging here is now performed with the method from the previous slide. Yes, so with some probability distribution. And these are local outcomes. And if you use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality for complex functions, you can uh, enter with this model of square here. And this E3 is upper bounded by uh, an average like this. Okay. So again, this is our correlator. And this is the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. And uh, uh, the reason why. Okay. So okay, it's one, yes? So it's one. No, 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 no. 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 Because the sigma plus. Okay, just a moment. This is exactly what I will speak about. So, for quantum systems, each of this is maximal one fourth, just yes, because you are on a block sphere. 
So this is maximally one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Because this, this is the sigma plus for quantum system corresponds to an average of a raising operator, sigma plus. So this is maximally one. So this is maximally one fourth, one fourth, one fourth average, one sixty fourth. Yeah. Yes. So do you think under carpet the fact that I potentially have to change between x and y? Sorry. So in your correlator, I don't see. I think it's sneak under the carpet that for bare normal value to work or steering to work, one party has to change the base. Yes. So when you construct this sigma plus. Yes. So, okay, if you can say, what does it mean to measure sigma plus? No, no, no. So this means, okay, for quantum systems, yeah. this would mean, uh, okay, I will come to this in a moment, okay? Oh, okay. So this one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, modulus square, one sixty fourth. So this is a criterion for entanglement, yes? Because if I assume that uh, quantum mechanics for each subsystems, then the violation of this inequality implies that the system cannot be written as a product of, as a separable state in general, and this is criterion for entanglement. But in general, if you recall that each such, such sigma plus modulus square is one fourth sigma x modulus square plus sigma y modulus square, then this is maximally one half. This is what Rafa referred to. So generally, most generally, if you do not impose restrictions of a block sphere for each subsystem, then this is maximally one, one half, one half, one half, so one eighth. So this is a very inequality, okay? And this, as you see, is, a, is in principle more difficult to, to, to violate. This is a, a smaller value. This one is very big. So this uh, typically, typically leads to a, uh, this representation of hierarchy of quantum correlations, where you have all quantum systems and the subsystem of entangled states, even more quantum subs a subsystem of your more quantum systems, which are the clear steering states and non-steerable states, and finding non-local null states, which are <clears> the most common. Now, coming back to your question, uh, let me just see. So, for quantum systems, I have to put here sigma x plus i sigma y, yes? And then I will have calculate the product. So I will have in total eight averages, mm -hmm. modulus square. So all these eight averages must be calculated independently. Okay, so the average is not just over the state. No, 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 no. So no. All, all the yes. settings shows them. Yes. Yes. So here it's, it's, like, it's like in the quality. Like in a band Similar. Okay, but. You also have a different. Yeah, but for example, you can violate steering by Alice can be just one outcome for the group and well, no locality, you need two outcomes, two outcomes. So they start with this, no? How much you can average yes. average over okay, I don't want to work with this. Okay. This I spoke about the graph. And uh, by the way, there is a, a big literature on this kind of, of bell correlations by which yields these products of sigma plus operators. There are these papers of Margaret Reid, Cavalcanti, Peter Drummond, uh, and so on. And there is also the most general formulation of uh, bell inequalities for n, n qubits. And this is by Marek Zhukowski and, and Czesław Bruckner. And, uh, mm, you can demonstrate that these kinds of inequalities which are used here are uh, as, is a subsystem of these most general inequalities uh, introduced in this paper. But for two qubits, does it? For two qubits, it does not introduce. Uh, so the uh, CHSH is all you need for two qubits. Yes, but then it's equivalent to CHSH. The, 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 the most general, qubit? this one which is here. No, but, but this one is the sigma. No, plus, no. no. Well, this is. Too, too primitive for um, two qubits. So for two qubits, you need you use CHSH. Mm -hmm. For more, you either use the most general one. Yeah. What does it mean most general? If you go back to the previous slide, I sticked here with sigma plus, but in principle, 
I could use sigma one minus for uh, sigma plus or sigma minus or any combination. Mm -hmm. And this uh, most general inequality, which uh, Marek Zhukowski produced, is, is symmetrized over all possible choices for each part. And okay. this way it adapts to any possible geometry of, of each substance. So to have something equivalent to CHSH for two qubits, you need also sigma minus. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Because the Bern uh, non locality is encoded in a bigger number of elements of the density matrix than this operator alone uses. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, then this is only for two one. So the Zhukovsky inequality doesn't work if I add it to the three measurements. Yes, there are for two quantities, yes. So these are almost general, each part has two measurements. Yes, and two measurements, one. yes. Okay. okay. So let's proceed. <clears throat> oh, very simple stuff, which I guess most of you are very familiar. Uh, for an uh, interferometer, I assume a, a linear system which takes uh, an, an qubits and particles with uh, two degrees of freedom and uh, imprints some uh, phase dependence and the sensitivity if this is a linear uh, process, which means it does not correlate the particles by itself. Uh, is limited by short noise uh, for all uh, separable states. And to beat the, the short noise limit, you need uh, uh, a non separable state. And this uh, means that this, uh, this relation is somehow related to this part of this graph. Yes. And there are, there are these famous territories, German Rectory, my corner, and Sversi, which, which uh, argue. Such a relation is indeed between the entanglement and sensitivity. Now, uh, so as I argued, uh, subshot noise sensitivity, we know this very well, is related to, to, to quantum entanglement. But there are also some papers which relate the uh, sensitivity in some particular schemes to uh, EPR steering. So, in other words, they demonstrate that there are some EPR steerable state, non steerable states. Uh, which uh, can give such my nice sensitivity. And uh, this paper, uh, this is a recent nature communications from an ex postdoc of uh, Augustus Merz. And uh, uh, the relation between Bell uh, non locality and uh, sensitivity uh, has also been discussed in a, in a number of papers, including one of our papers with Augustus Merz um, and Keza Todd also. And one paper on this. So this is what I will speak now. I now I go to the meritum of the, of the problem. Is somehow it gives a general framework to, to link these three types of correlations and relate them to, to subshot noise sensitivity. Okay. So now I have like uh, three uh, uh, quite technical slides, but I need to try to throw the derivation. Otherwise, it's Okay, so this is our interferometer, which uh, in principle uh, gives some short noise sensitivity. And uh, I would like to link somehow the possibility of beating the short noise with, uh, with this kind of correlator. So what I would like now to demonstrate that if you beat, if you violate this kind of equality, and you assume nothing about your subsystems. So you, you allow for Bell non-locality, <clears throat> then in some cases, this can imply subshot noise sensitivity, which would be something similar to what we know about the relation between entanglement and non-locality. And this N, this N here is, is this N, so the number of, of particles which part pass through the interferometer is the number of, is the order of correlator. So in principle, this is a, a truly many body part of question. Yes. And the basic tool will be the Kramer-Rao bound, uh, which relates the sensitivity, which one over square root of uh, what we call the Fisher information, and this uh, lower index Q denotes that it's quantum, which means it's this is a quantity which provides the best possible precision optimized over all 
measurements allowed by, by quantum mechanics. And uh, the, I will need a particular uh, explicit expression for FQ. And uh, I will use a form which uses the spectral decomposition of the density matrix. This is rho of theta, which means it is a density matrix which passed through the interferometer. And if you have this spectral decomposition, then FQ is equal to two times sum over all eigenvalues. Here are the eigenvalues minus one square. Here is the sum. And here is the matrix element of H. H is what generates your dynamics, for instance, for the max and the parameter. This is a sum of sigma y operators. For other interferometers, you would have in principle linear operators. You would have in principle any other sigma oriented along any other axis. So what is here is the matrix element of this generator of the interferometer transformation modulus square. Okay, so this is the a well-known expression we owe it to Einstein and Capes in this seminal work in 94. Okay, so this is our density matrix. This is the Fisher information. This is the generator. I took here sigma y, but uh, as I said, I can take any orientation. This is irrelevant which orientation I take. So any kind of linear interferometer acting on, on qubits would work. Now the question is how to quantify the non-locality, and I will use the, cor the correlators, all possible correlators between any choice of k out of n qubits. So I use correlators of order k, where k is n from 2 to n. And this is a product of sigma plus, but also I could allow for sigma minus. And I1, ik is n string of k particles picked from, from a set of n. And uh, if you recall from a couple of slides before, this, if this beats this, this uh, value, remember there was one, two, one, two, one, two for three qubits. So in, in general, this would be one, two to the power of k, then there is no locality. And the goal now would be to somehow link these values for any k, if you find the k, for yes, yes, k. yes, you will see it is a, it is sub with FQ, and if I link it with FQ, I link it with something. And the the the, the approach is, is the following. Uh, so this is our FQ, and I neglect the denominator. If I neglect the denominator, I decrease the value of FQ. Why? Because these are the eigenvalues. So they are their sum of only two of them is smaller equal than unity. So if you kick this out, you provide a lower bound for FQ. Okay, so I simply by hands erase the denominator. And this way I provide a lower bound for FQ. If I have a lower bound for FQ, then from the Kramer Rao bound, I have an upper bound for this instrument. Okay, now once you have this, you can enter with this PI and PJ inside here. And uh, recalling that these are the eigenvalues of your density matrix, this will boil down to the matrix element of the commutator of your density matrix with the generator. Now you can see that you can sum over one of these indices, for instance, i or j, because this is a, a module square, so you can write it as bracket, cat bra, and sum over one of the indices using the completeness of the eigenstates of, of, of the spectral decomposition. And this is what you obtained. This is, by the way, formula which Augustus Marx with Manuel Gessner, which well, I, we did it first. You did it first. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. You know, Augusta told me this. So. Yeah, so you found it by trace norm and then you found it by trace norm. Okay. 
Just a strand. Oh, I like this case. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll talk later. I'll ask you for more. <laughs> uh, so this is the the this is there is no uh, simplification. So once you kick out the denominator. These steps are uh, strict. There is no uh, no other inequality added. Okay, this stuff is the if you have small school grants, okay. Because there are problems with PI and PJR. Okay, but we can. This is like this. Okay, so now to to proceed with the calculation, I will I will use the basis of the product. Of so, so you mean uh, so so so, yeah, so you I mean so you remove cross terms. Yeah, you mean sum over one index? You mean you put i equal j or what? No, no, no. I summed over r uh, over j. Ah, okay. I summed over j, and this way this all expressed. You had only psi i psi i, and this you can express in, in terms of of trace. You see, if you have psi i psi i sum, you can. If you are lucky enough, you can find a trace sum. Okay, but there is. As you said, I mean, there is no, no simplification, no, 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 index, no, no additional, index. no, no assumption. Okay, so now I will decompose the density matrix in a particular basis, which is the basis of the eigenstates of these sigmas, which, which generate the the transformation. In the case of Mazender, this would be sigma uh, sigma wise, but can be any. Okay, so this looks okay. Ah, because, but there is row squared. Okay. Yes, it because is not a because normally Fisher is smaller than variance. than four times the, the variance of the density. Yes, this is Kilbert Yes. Well, the yes. So uh, again, uh, I will use the density matrix, the composing the basis of eigenstates of the sigma wise, and. Uh, there are two to the power of n such elements, naturally. And this is a huge, you know, a huge density matrix. But uh, if I have this, I know how to act with, uh, with the sigma y's, which are here. Here will be sigma y's if I insert this h here and so h. And this way, I will know how to act with them on the elements of the density matrix. Naturally, in general, I don't know nothing, I know nothing about rho. Okay, so this is our inequality. This is the density matrix. Uh, these are the, the eigenstates, one body eigenstates. This is the, the generator. And uh, uh, if you perform the, so you put H here and here, act with the sigmas on, on row, then this is what you obtain. This is again, no other assumption. N up and M up is the number of up spins in row in N or in M. So you take N, let's say this is 15 spins up, 17 down. Okay. Up so in the Y basis, yes. In up the Y basis. In the Y basis. In any basis you you want. Okay. And uh, row and N is the matrix element. Yeah, so from this, this is a matrix element of your density matrix. And now this is the crucial part. <clears throat> Mainly, uh, you can, uh, this is a, a natural, but you have to stay. If you have any cat, for instance, a cat of three, let's assume we have three groups. One is up, two are down. Then I can express it in terms of any other cat from this basis by doing a proper number of raising or, or lowering operations. I could, for instance, if there was up here and up here, then this one qubit I, I do not touch, yes? I leave it up. But the other, all the, those other that I need to, to align, I, I have to flip up or not. What does it mean? This means that this row and N which is a matrix element N M. In fact, I can write as rho and N. But I have to do a proper number of raising spins and a proper number of lowering spins. And how much it is, it depends naturally on the structure of this N over. 
So what I'm saying is that you can get rid of n n. You can write it in terms of n n, but you have to do the proper number of raising and lowering of operations. And now this looks already very similar to the Bell correlator I introduced before, because this is this looks a bit like a part of a trace of your density matrix with some number of raising and lowering operators. That's my comparison. It's something. Yeah. Sushi. Sushi. Okay. Uh, and this is basically the, that's it. You have to do some algebraic stuff. But what so what I want to say is that this row and n I can express in this way. So as a row and n. So a, a diagonal part, but I have to do an appropriate number of raising and lowering. So that this n is transformed into n, like here. Yes. So to, to to transform this n into this n, I had to one raising to lower. So if you have the diagonal, and all the diagonal, you can then be you can construct with a, some number of raising and lowering. If where's n hidden? n is hidden in this j. Where it is hidden, m is hidden in the in the number. With this i and j, so we go i and j. This is n plus and minus. So a number of raising, a number of lowering. So this is encoded, which from which a m I started is encoded in the structure of this raising and lowering. And the, the rest is, uh, is just another well, it's sort of algebraic, but the rest is, is quite straightforward. So let's bring all together. So this, this is the common row. This was what we obtained uh, just by neglecting the denominator and the official information. And uh, this is our row and row. Then you have to add one more inequality, which links the modulus square of a sum to the sum of modulus square. This introduces the uh, a term like this in the denominator. This is an inequality for, for complex numbers. And this way, you obtain the final result. So FQ bigger equal, here is this two. And now I have to sum, I don't sum over the matrix elements anymore, but rather than this, I sum by all the possibilities of raising and lowering, because any element of the density matrix can be obtained from a proper number of raising and lowering operators. Here is the, the coefficient, and here is a sum over all possible bell correlators. E n plus and minus is the bell correlator with a particular choice of n plus raising and minus lowering. And there is a sum over all the possibilities. And this way are linked the sensitivity with the bell correlators in a very complicated uh, expression. It's not simple now to read out uh, how this would play out, but I will illustrate with some examples. So this is precision versus normal kind. And this was published in May 2021 with, uh, as I said, Now, some limiting cases just to, to, to get some feeling. So this is the expression. First thing I can do is I can take a, a product of uh, uncorrelated qubits up plus down uh, coherent coherent product uh, pro coherent superposition at the level of one body and then a product. This is a pure state, which means that actually all these inequalities are saturated. There you can if you follow the derivation, there is no bigger equal. It's equal. If you plug it this and calculate all these n's, you obtain the following uh, expression. And if you put it in here, you can do the sum analytically. And this is what you get. A shot. It's very good because it cannot be anything. It could be smaller, but cannot be anything. Bigger. 
if you take a GHZ state, then also these inequalities are saturated because it's a pure state and you can again follow the derivation and you see that you saturate mm -hmm. those steps. You take a GHZ, you obtain that only the maximal and body correlators are uh, non-zero, they are equal to one fourth. This is natural because in a GHZ state, you have only the full and body correlation. If you trace out one particle, this is a completely classical state. And if you plug it in, you obtain F2 equal to N squared, so the Heisenberg limit. And uh, you can ask what is in between, between this uh, cl classical case and extreme case, then it gets difficult the analysis. What you can say, for instance, is that if your maximal correlator, so N, a product of N rising operators and zero lowering operators is bigger than this limit, then uh, this means you can show that N minus N qubits are very correlated, correlated. And then you violate, uh, th this is the bound for the Fisher convention. But in general, I must admit that analysis of this expression is, is difficult, is cumbersome, because there is a sum of all possible bare correlators. And this is a, a, a complex many body system. It's hard to say from, from, from scratches which ENs will be large and which will be small in, in your particular physical uh, realization. You can do some numerics, like we did with Apple. You can take an easy chain, uh, so uh, yeah. an easy chain, 16 spins you took, open boundary conditions. So you have the, the, the magnetic field local and uh, neighbor, nearest neighbor interaction. And you can calculate the ground state of your system as a function of, of u. We took negative u because we know there is a quantum phase transition. No. And this is uh, what you obtain. This is the, so you take this ground state, calculate the ground state, and then pass it through the mass and the interferometer and calculate FQ and normalize it to the shock noise. For U equals zero, the ground state is, is a ground state of non-interacting particles. So you obtain one, which is the shock noise which is okay, non-interacting classical. Then when you increase U at negative values, then you, when you cross this minus one, the fish information starts to grow quite rapidly and you tend to, to a GHZ state. So, uh, so a very quantum state, which gives you the Heisenberg scale. This is for 16 particles, so you have the FQ over 16 is 16, so the Heisenberg. And by the way, well, once you plot the fish information, you can analyze the, the bell correlators and you can show that uh, here at the where you approach the Heisenberg limit, all the 16 spirits, spins are non-local, here 15 are non-local and so on. There are these very tiny lines here which show that how the non-locality decreases as the Fisher information. But here the, the generator is sigma... Sigma y. Sigma y of the way. And, and, and you take the ground state of this. Yes, yes. You can take, uh, again, uh, a bosonic case, so this for this for uh, so again, this. So is it non trivial if I grapple if I optimize for the local unit values? Okay, would uh, the results not change? Could I do better? By uh, no, you could not, but this is best, the best this is optimized in other because the state is very yes. invariant. But uh, in principle, yes, you could think about optimizing. Okay. I, I just pick one axis for, for illustration, but. Okay, the other example would be something analog to this uh, to chain of spins, so uh, a collection of indistinguishable uh, qubits, like a Bose-Einstein condensate in a, in a double well potential. So the two levels are the left and right well. Then you have, you don't have sigma z uh, addressing separate particles, but you have collective operators only because you have indistinguishable particles. This is your Hamiltonian. So again, the, the hopping between the two sides plus the uh, two-body interaction term. 
you find the ground state of this Hamiltonian and pass it through Maxander. You obtain something similar. Here you can go to higher n, this is 1000, because uh, you know these are qubits, so the Hilbert space is dimension of Hilbert space is much smaller, so you can push it all the way you want. So this is for 1000. This is basically a very similar behavior to this. It's more rapid because there are more particles. So again, where you approach the Fisher information to the Heisenberg limit, you have all 1000 qubits uh, non-locally correlated. Here, 1999, and you have this relation between growing non-locality and growing precision of your Fisher information. And uh, last, my last slide, mm -hmm. you can somehow relate these behaviors from the previous slide to, to this quantum criticality or quantum. But here you plotted just the Fisher, yes? Or yes. Not, not, no, not no. this bound. F Fisher, and on top of this, I just put, showed where uh, uh, all the qubits are non locally correlated, where n minus one. Just, just. Yes, but this was obtained from this bound or not? No, no, this was independent. independent. Ah. This was just to illustrate the relation. So what the bound says? The bound, uh, uh, okay, I would need to plot this. The bound would saturate here because it's a, uh, here I guess you would, uh, it would be slightly unsaturated, but I, I, I would need to, to check this. So, okay. so I understand from the bound, even that the observed feature being, I don't know, 998, I can make a statement how many qubits are on over. Yes. Right? But yes. this is not the dash. No, no, no. This is this is independent calculation. So okay. I calculate the correlator and independently I calculate the fission. This is just to illustrate the relation. And finally, uh, I take these two, two systems and I, uh, if I recall that for large n, you have a, a quantum phase transition in the system, which means that you, you you break from, from a coherent state to something like a JZ state. So you break your system to a, a macroscopic superposition and you can plot. So the upper line, this plots the maximal n volume per correlator normalized to the local, non-locality limit. And when it crosses unity as a function of U, so as a function of the interaction term, then the non locality appears in your system. This is for 12 and 16 spins of this system. So you see that in a vicinity of u equal to minus one, the many body non locality emerges in your system. And this is exactly when we plot the derivative of fission information, when the fission information starts to grow very rapidly. So there is a relation which I don't, did not analyze in analytically yet, but which is here only shown numerically, between the, this passing discrete quantum critical point and the emergence of many body in a And this is the same for a BC metabolic well, across the critical point, so your many body non locality appear, starts to appear. This is the solid is for 1000. This is, for, I guess, for 500 qubits. And uh, again, you see that exactly at this point, the Fisher information here is shown, its derivative starts to grow very rapidly. And uh, such a relation between quantum criticality and metrology has been. Analyzed in many papers, there are many of these papers, Matteo Pani and, and his, uh, his group. So uh, I spoke here to summarize about the hierarchy of quantum correlations, uh, then the relation between the most well known resource for quantum metrology, which is entanglement. I derived this bound linking uh, locality with metrology and I illustrated with some physical examples. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we now have time for questions. Maybe I can I can start 
because I was wondering uh, in, in the derivation of the bound, what would happen if you just restrict yourself to symmetric states from the beginning, to symmetrize states of all qubits? Would it make sense to- So to, to bosonic repeat? systems, yes? Yes, from the very beginning. So just don't think that, okay, I, I do a first particle on second, but everything is symmetric. So I yes. just mean the number of, of raised and yes. lowering and yes. so on. so you can do this. I, I have a paper on, on archive exactly on this problem, which is a follow-up to this one. And that, but then you don't have the uh, sigma plus, sigma plus, but you have just a collective mm -hmm. raising of uh, yeah. all qubits, n times. And then you can, uh, you can derive uh, a similar correlator, but there, there will be some combinatory terms because, mm -hmm. uh, but okay, the, the derivations, you can do this. I don't know if I can say something very smart. But these correlators would be less strong to see non locality, probably, no? Are probably or not? Why? Well, because you you have this choice of uh, measurements, the average over, you know? Well, I don't know, this would be my intuition. Well, but you have also a, the state is symmetric. You know? Yes, but there are symmetric states that I can violate non locality by. I see. I, I don't know. Okay. Don't bring the time. You're saying that I'm imposing restrictions on the local operations this way, yes? Yes, and what Alice, they need to sum, sum up, they need to sum up the output. If they did local measurements, you know, measure something collective, mm -hmm. instead of summing the output. Yes. They could do something some art and contract the bad on the I don't know. I don't know. Okay, any any other questions? Well maybe I have one which is more than motivation, it's just to understand. Like this play the devil's advocate a bit, no? Because when people do non-locality, they get really excited about making statements without assuming the quantum mechanics. Yes. So somehow in this business, if I understand correctly, right, you assume quantum mechanics, you don't kind of, um, you really talk about properties of states. You want to classify states that can be useful for metrology and violate uh, non locality. Yeah, but this is a proper bell bound, which just means it's derived with the bound itself. Is derived without an assumption of quantum mechanics. Yes, but um, in the end, I make statements about states. About states, states yes. So I'm interested in Born rule to violate bounds. So, okay, no, I think I understand. Normally, the statements about the non locality are for probability distribution, mm -hmm. not for states. So it's something in between, no? You. But the bound itself, I, I, I'm not sure it's a restriction because the bound itself. Is derived without any assumption. Then, indeed, I am when I'm deriving the relation so, between. So, basically, I should say like this: you give me a state, and I ask a question. If I now derive the bound based on the states, assuming for the rule, but this bound would work beyond quantum mechanics because it's normal. Quantum. No, there is no bound rule. In this, the bound is derived, assuming, making no assumption apart from binary outcomes. The bound. This is crucial. The bound is a proper. Uh, Burn inequality. Then I am doing the calculations for quantum systems. I agree. Exactly. This was like, okay, yeah, I of course. But the, the bell inequality for a K partite uh, correlator yes. is, is a proper bell inequality. It makes no assumption. No, it does not use. Uh, maybe, maybe we can let somebody from online audience to ask a question. Is there anybody who wants to ask? Question, then unmute yourself. Yannick is waiting. Full, full waiting. <laughs> okay, I gave you the chance. So now I, I have another question because, so you are trying to somehow, you're talking about the locality, you, you try to distinguish it from entanglement. Yes. Because this is something stronger. Yes. So, so obviously a natural question is, where is this point where you yes. have entanglement and no non-locality? And what happens when you enter into this regime of non-locality? 
Would you be able to say something about meteorological properties of oh, this, this point? Very cool. I'd like to because know, this would be very cool. Yes. But I don't believe it's 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 oil. I mean, I I would be surprised if there was some really something significant from meteorological point of view but at no, this point. Maybe some some suggestion is is this plot. So here, what I'm doing here, I'm finding a ground state of a, let's say bosonic eclipse. Yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, as a function of the interaction. So as soon as I turn the interactions on, the yes. system is entangled. Yes. And if you plot the Fisher information, it, it grows from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Of course. But then only as you pass this critical point, when only at this point, the bare correlate, correlations start to appear. Mm. And then this is exactly where the Fisher information starts to, mm. because I'm showing here that yeah, it's not clear. I'm showing the derivative of Fisher information starts to rapidly grow. Mm. But okay. to show this analytically, oh, this would be great. I don't know how to do this because at the end this expression. Yeah. So okay. So so it would be nice to be able to say, okay. So so in some sense your bounds. Ah, but your bounds tell you what is the uh, is larger than something. Yes. It would be nice to have something where you can say that there's the smaller. Opposite. Yes, exactly. Where you don't have violation, and then with entanglement, you can only reach yes. something up to yes. something. So yes. it would be nice to have something like people do that they like Marcus Robert Hallett. So you have a spin squeezing, for instance, you measure spin squeezing, mm -hmm. and you know that if spin squeezing is bigger than something. Yes. Then, then you have k partite entanglement. Mm -hmm. So the, the opposite relation. Yes, the, I tried to derive it, I don't know how to do it. Well, maybe just, just a comment, it would be really cool because it's known if I have two parties and I uh, and I am doing your calculation, so I'm assuming one of states, then it's actually known signaling that imposes one of the square root of them. Mm -hmm. So it's not even known locality, right? Mm -hmm. But this is for two parties. Yes. And now you have n-body correlators, so maybe now suddenly it's it's not collapsing on the non-signaling. It's actually no locality to place it wrong. But not to beat the shot noise, because I I can find here numerically states which are very slightly uh, they are a bit correlated, so to say, but not they are entangled, but not non-local, not at least according to this correlator. So you have entanglement, you beat the shot noise, but you don't have the non-locality. The non-locality seems to be a resource to rapidly accelerate the sensitivity. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying for my part, it was shown that the shot noise, the states at the level of probabilities, if you want to assume states, yes. that the shot noise you get just from imposing the non-signaling non on your project. Mm -hmm. But that's my project. Okay, I think. Um, we have to stop. Okay, so thanks, Yannick, again. And see you next week.